Let's talk about using Agile with distributed and international teams. Now, I'll summarize this for you. By the way, do you know what this means? It stands for too long, don't read, and it kind of means this is an executive summary. It's a sort of internet shorthand that the young people use. And, and the summary here is that you've already learned what techniques work with Agile. You've already learned how to create an Agile-friendly environment that will help you drive towards those Agile outcomes that you want and all of those same things apply if your team members are abroad or international. So you basically have three choices. A, get everybody in the same place somehow. B, make those um, employees that are, that are somewhere else their own discrete agile team so that they can, they can execute the same plays that you're executing and, and create their own take on agile. You should, Spotify does this, for example. Or C, you can try really hard to make it work with a couple of the team members within your Agile team being somewhere else. And that's really hard, and that's, that's mostly what we'll talk about in case, for whatever reason, you're in that situation and you need to make it work. I, I will say this, if you have a team or team members that are abroad, th there are a few good reasons for that. Technical talent is really hard to find and recruit, so if that's the only place you could find the talent that you need, then hey, okay. If it's because you are localizing a product and you want a local team to work on that so that they understand the operating environment of the buyer, that's a great reason to have a team abroad. If you're focused on getting the lowest possible day rate per hour, then this may not be the case, but there may be an issue where you're focused on output. You know, how do we create the most amount of code for the least price? And that's really kind of counter to most of what we talked about. Our, our idea here that we're trying to learn about is let's create less code that's more valuable rather than let's just generate a lot of output and hope that somehow we hit on something good. So with that said, let's talk about how to make it work if some of your team members are someplace else. And we'll organize this around the, uh, the four jobs that we have here. On learning, you're going to need to tell and retell your stories. There's a lot of cultural context that these team members will not have. I mean, if they're in the mountains of Argentina and you're in Atlanta, Georgia, and let's say it's the H&H &H people, well, probably HVAC installation, repair, and whatnot works different in the, in the Andes than it does in, in Atlanta. And so things that were implicit in your narrative that were okay for your team in Atlanta are not gonna be clear or obvious to the team in Argentina. So one good thing to do is to go there where your team is and see what it's like and talk to them about the narratives. Another good thing to do is to make sure you're documenting the narrative. Now, we, we've talked about the fact that narrative is only useful as a collaboration tool and that there's not this perfect spec that you can write up and expect everybody to execute just the way that you wanted. But if the narrative is not available to them because they can't have these informal discussions in the office, you'll, you'll need to find a way to make it available to them. Another thing you may find outside the U.S., though certainly not everywhere, is that a lot of the developers will want more prescriptive, specific inputs. And this may be kind of deep-seated. It may be part of the, the way that their education system worked. It may be part of the way they're used to working with uh, teams that are, that are in another country and, and are hiring them. And that will, of course, vary from country to country and person to person. But if you're finding that, that they say, hey, just can you just give me the spec or you know, just can you just be specific about what you want me to do, you're going to have to make sure that you're showing them these principles of Agile, and you're not just telling them, no, um, I, I'm not going to give you specific inputs because we're doing Agile and expect them to understand why and what that means. You can, you can put them on this Coursera class. You can go there and do a workshop for them and show examples of how you work, but don't expect them to necessarily know how narrative functions in Agile. It's, it's new to most people, even in, in the most sophisticated operating environments. Now let's talk about deciding. Short cycles and seeing finished work early, well, just like it does for a regular Agile team, will suss out a lot of problems early and, and help you see those and figure out which ones are important so you can work on fixing those with the team. It's very important to have some overlap time. I've heard a guideline of at least two hours a day. I would certainly think that's a bare, bare minimum. I mean, if, if you have Less than that, I think it'll be really challenging to make this work. If you have more than that, it'll, it'll make it a little easier. 
If you don't have the opportunity to do daily stand-ups together, try to improvise them somehow. Like maybe, for example, uh, have everybody write them up over email or after people do them in person, they send a quick email. And it, that's kind of a pain and it's, there's a reason why it's not part of the standard way of doing daily stand-ups, but you might want to test that and just see how it works out for everybody, uh, particularly with regard to making the offshore team more, more successful. We talked about this already, but automation will, will certainly help. It's self-encapsulated, it's available to everybody without a lot of documentation and explanation, and, and so that'll be an asset that'll help everybody on the team and, and help work through a bunch of other issues that you might otherwise have about coordinating builds and testing, things like that. And likewise, continuous integration and virtualization will help a lot. And, and so this applies to development and test environments. So formalizing an environment on the working machines that the developers and testers are using with tools like currently Vagrant is very popular and quite handy for creating a, a standardized virtual build of a operating system on, on a machine. Um, and then Docker is very popular at the moment for doing that on servers. There are a lot of similar tools. The idea is to self-describe and automate the creation of these environments so that you don't have environment to environment issues so that it's not a big pain for the, off, the people that are off site to learn how to do this and figure it out because they're not sitting next to somebody who did it a week ago. So that, that'll help a lot. Subtle but important thing. Another important thing is to do that same set of things for test environments. So if there is a interface or software running for some kind of internal system in your company, make sure they have access to that or that you can create a stub service, like a fake version of it or something so that whatever test tools you find that you need to have to do your job well are readily available to that team. Because they may try to work around those things, again, they don't want to bother you, but in fact, they're, they're testing against an environment that's not realistic. And as you, as you run through your cycles, you'll start seeing that, hey, what, it's weird that this thing broke. It's, well, it's because you know, the folks elsewhere didn't have ready access to the test environments when they needed them and creates a whole big mess that'll take a lot more time to fix after the fact. We've talked about how the whole team is really important in, in managing and the, really the, the, the ways to work around this are probably relatively self-evident to you. Lots of open chats, uh, tools like Slack are really good. Lots of video conferences, maybe even like leaving them kind of up for, you know, some cases for the overlap period. All that stuff will help. Invest in the relationship. So if you're going to go or they're going to come visit, you take them out to dinner, your, your other team members, and spend time together. You may take for granted that you have a personal relationship with your working team in a way that you kind of need to do on an accelerated basis if you're working with people that are not at the same site. This is an interesting one, particularly if you're working with collaborators from another culture, a lot of the time, and especially if they're on contract and you're working at the company, they're going to want to say, yes, sure, I'll try to do that. And so one of the important things is what I call getting to know. I mean, where you know that you have a good working relationship with them, if you explain a bunch of stuff, you ask them, does it make sense? And they say, no, I don't understand. Or you ask them, um, you know, do you think you can get this story done by Wednesday? No, I don't think I can. I need more time. Well, that, that's a good sign. That means you're communicating. A team is telling you what they really think and that, and that you're getting a more healthy correspondence built up. So those are a few tips and ideas and alternatives for getting agile working when you're needing to find talent in a bunch of different places.